I am really delighted to introduce a person I've had the pleasure. Does this work now too? Okay. Uh, I've had the pleasure to get to know since he arrived. We, we got together very quickly after David arrived and we've, got, we've had a few lunches together and talked about ideas together because we, we each believe very much in collaboration. That's led to an invitation to speak at our brown bags. Uh, David is a perfect fit for the Mariah Mitchell Association. Um, and the, um, I want, want to tell you that he comes from Brattleboro, Vermont, his last position in the Organic Trade Association where he was chief operating officer since 2000. He's an expert in fundraising and development. That's both an announcement and a warning. Uh, I've told David that if there's any fundraising for Mariah Mitchell done in our halls, that he's going to discover that whatever he raises is equivalent to the cost of renting this hall for the day. Okay, so he's on, he's on uh, warning for that. Uh, the, uh, he's, he and David, he and Shelly, uh, his wife, Shelly Dresser, have uh, worked together all of their lives, professional lives, and they were both executive directors of the Bonnyvale Environmental Education Center. That was a center that will sound familiar in its description. They had research going on, they had summer camps, citizen science, and a very dynamic school outreach program. Dave has a, uh, David has a BA uh, in environmental studies from the University of Massachusetts, and an MA uh, in environmental studies from the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies at Yale University. The, uh, he's also a novice sailor. He has a shell boat, 18-foot shell boat, uh, built in uh, Georgia, Vermont. David, I've noticed uh, in his enthusiasm, lives not only for science, but for teaching science and awakening curiosity in science. And so would you please help us welcome David Gagnon. Thanks. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, and thank you to the NHA for having this, uh, this program in place, the Brownback uh, Lunches. I'm really excited to be here today. Although I have to say, uh, I thought Bill had said I might have misunderstood him that there was going to be a small band here as well to do the introduction and a little bit of music, but that didn't happen. So that's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll work around that. But uh, thank you all of you. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here. Um, we, um, we're really, I'm really excited to be here. Also, I will be introducing later on Dr. Uh, Regina Jorgensen, who's our new astronomer. So I'll save that, but that will be coming. She's going to be speaking for part of this time that we have today. So, so Mariah Mitchell is America's first woman astronomer. She had a profound impact on scientific understanding and the study of astronomy. I try to imagine how this amazing woman in 1847, at age 29, had the brilliance and fortitude to make the very careful observations required to identify the Mitchell Comet. And this is at a time when there were only really basic telescopes. There was no electronic tracking or motors that, uh, that helped the uh, uh, telescope track different items. She had to actually do this all manually. So only through patient adjustments and careful record keeping was she able to make her discoveries. She was really very passionate about teaching and learning and that people learned best by doing. And she insisted that women professors, I love this, at Vassar College, she was the first professor at Vassar College and of course by that fact she was also the first woman professor at Vassar College, be paid the same as men professors. And, uh, and this was in the middle 1800s, and she was successful in that insistence. And, um, and it's, to me, that's just amazing. The Mariah Mitchell Association today reflects the passion of Mariah Mitchell and her love of learning. Um, so I'd like to tell you uh, through some examples a little bit more about uh, the Mariah Mitchell Association and what we're doing, what we're doing today. But I also want to make one comment, and I was thinking about this as I was walking over here today is that there's a really an interesting connection between Mariah Mitchell and the sea captains that, uh, that um, traveled the world. And that was that she was instrumental, her and her dad, and Jason Finger, our deputy director is here, and she will be happy to uh, correct me if I'm, if I'm incorrect. <laughs> and, um, 
is that she helped to actually calibrate those, uh, the equipment used to, to, to navigate around the world. And when I think about that, when you think about the size of the world, if she was off on some of her calculations or set the instrumentation just a little off, it really had a profound impact on um, the survival of the, of the, uh, the folks on the ships. So, uh, and she did a, from what I understand, she did a wonderful job and was able to, um, to help uh, in calibrating these instruments. Very, a very important uh, aspect of navigation at that time. So I think that was an interesting connection. So what I'd like to do to start with, because it's always interesting to me to understand what people know about the Mariah Mitchell Association. When I ask around, I get a lot of different answers, and I'd love to ask you to start with. Let me see if I can get this to work. OK. And to encourage you to perhaps participate in this unofficial survey, I have a few gifts that I'm going to hand out to people that might have a few ideas. So can anybody give me, what do you think of when you think of the Mariah Mitchell Association? What's one or two words? Yes. Here you go. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> well, I should have waited until you said something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I was a young child, every summer, I would go to Mariah Mitchell for a couple of hours a day. And in addition to doing all of the things up at the, uh, at the facility, we would go to at low tide down to the jetties and go into the tide pools and just look at all of the sea life that was there. Probably the happiest moments of my young life in the summertime. And in, it, it's all Mariah Mitchell. That's, that's great to hear. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, somebody else? What do you think of when you think of Mariah Mitchell? I think of Mariah Mitchell, or the association, in terms of how much Margaret Harwood did for Nantucket High School students uh, during uh, economic hard times on the island. She um, used her own funds to make sure that they could continue in school and higher education. And then when I graduated from high school, she and um, Dart Hofflight and Eileen McGrath together made sure that I was admitted to Radcliffe College. That's great. Thank you, and I love hearing these stories because a lot of them I haven't heard yet. I've got something that I think is perfect for you. These are buttons that were, you'll see these around this summer. Uh, I think I have a really, here we go. You know, Nantucket was a, is actually the first place to see the sunrise on the first of the year. Very exciting. And that was uh, discovered by our Vladimir, um, uh, our previous astronomer. So anybody else have something they'd like to add? All right. I knew I would have to do this, but I have a hat I actually will give away next. So if I can get someone else. Would you like to say something? Thanks. Um, boy, there are so many references to the Maria Mitchell. The one that immediately came to mind when you started was to Pasha Bog. It was the first um, conservation property that was uh, used by the Maria Mitchell Association back in 1925. It was designated as a conservation property. It's now um, under the uh, ownership of the Conservation Foundation. And I have the pleasure of leading a walk around that property uh, every summer. Uh, just a beautiful property. And in my mind, it really represents what conservation has done for Nantucket. Thank you. Can you answer that? <laughs> sure. And sir, you're going to go home with uh, quite a lot today. So I have a hat, hat for you as well. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, how do I advance the slides? Do I have a? Just through here. Okay. Great. There we go. Okay. So just to, just to give some examples, I mean, we MMA provides uh, science education and research opportunities in a variety of disciplines: astronomy, marine science. Natural science, ecology, 
and of course, preserving the legacy of Mariah Mitchell. So MMA really creates the spark through our internship programs for college and students and our educational programs that reach thousands annually. The Mariah Mitchell Association has encouraged many to pursue careers in science. So we're going to quote Bernie Sanders here, but the impact is huge. It really is. And I think what I'm really excited about is what I'd like to do at this point is to talk about the actual individuals, just like we did already, that have actually benefited from their involvement with Mariah Mitchell, and in that way, talk about some of the programs that we offer today. So the first individual, Emily Parker, she's right now a lead educator at Living Classrooms at, for the National Capital Region outside of DC. She was a Mariah Mitchell Associate Education instructor, and she also did the summer camps. Um, what's really exciting to me and something I learned when I first got here is we have, a, we have a lot of interns that go through a very extensive training program. We have over 27 interns that are here for the summertime, college interns. Uh, they go through extensive training. They actually have to produce lessons. The, the, the people that are doing the, um, the summer camps actually have to go through um, and produce lesson plans every week. So they're not just out there managing children and working in the field. They're actually thinking about what they're doing ahead of time, putting together lesson plans, and getting those plans approved by our director of education. So they learn a lot that they can use later on. Andrew Roy is another example. He was, uh, was one of our marketing interns. He now works for the New England Aquarium Development Office. Uh, we hire one or two marketing director, uh, marketing interns every year, and they do a, a variety of tasks. They do research. They actually get out into the community, and they work at our, um, they might work at our store or supply our, our gift, um, gift store um, um, with, uh, they'll work on ways to better market our gifts that we offer up. And they have a, a large variety of experiences, but they get to, um, so it's, it's been great. We actually have a couple that were here this winter time as well. Erickson, Erickson uh, Smith was a uh, MMA aquarium intern. He now works for the National Park Service. Uh, the aquarium, by the way, has about 7,000 7, visitors that we see in the summertime. If any of you have been there, and I suspect many of you had, it's a very, very small set of buildings, and it's always astounding to me that we get that many visitors. We also get visitors from uh, in a, uh, an aquatic sense as well. So not only do we we um, have our native species that are uh, really the focus of our, of our exhibits, but we also get visitors from the tropics. Because of our position in the ocean and the Gulf Stream, we always find two or three. We have a little box fish that was about the size, really about the size of the pea when we, when we found the box fish. Actually, I don't know whether it's a male or a female. I don't even know if we know. I don't even know how we could tell what it was. But anyway, we have this tiny box fish, and it's actually been in our tank all winter long because we can't release them in the fall, otherwise they just die. So we keep them, and he's about, he's about this big now, and um, they're really excited. He's a tropical fish that will actually probably make his way up to New England Aquarium. Uh, Kimberly Gonzalez, she was also an, uh, an MMA intern, and she now works for the Se uh, Seattle Aquarium. She does outreach and uh, helps with diversity issues and bringing more kids of, of diverse backgrounds. So we're really excited about the work she did here and how she took that later on. So we have about 1,000 natural science students, I mean 1,000 Nantucket students that actually take part in our educational programs throughout the year. So we have a, a major impact on a lot of the science learning that goes on. Andrew McCandless, I'm really excited. I just got to meet him last summer. Um, he's he's a, uh, a, a native, I believe native, he's been around for a long time, his family's been here. He worked with us as an intern when he was just a, a little guy, and we got him really excited and passionate about science. Um, he came here, he worked on the scallop research, and 10 years later he's pursuing his PhD at Portland State. And this past summer, he did eelgrass research on Nantucket Harbor. We actually supported him in those efforts and provided uh, laboratory space for him to do his work. He got a grant to do that. But I think as, as um, what's really interesting is we have, we have about 1,500 hours of 
time that's volunteered by these interns over the summer, by, by students on Nantucket that spend. Just yesterday we had six people in our, um, in our facilities and they were six kids that were middle school kids and they were really, they're an amazing bunch of kids, very enthusiastic, very willing to help out. And it's really important to run our organization. We need this help and it's nice to see that spark that occurred. Uh, Veronica Trufanova. Am I okay there, Jason? All right, close enough, right? <laughs> Veronica actually worked with, uh, with Jason, who's our, um, uh, of course, the deputy director and also the curator of the Mitchell House. And, um, and she, was, she was with us, and, and I know that uh, what's really exciting is now she took a lot of what she learned here and what she studied in college and brought that to the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. So she was a... Um, I think Jason thinks, uh, <laughs> uses her as the gold standard for, for interns. And, uh, you know, we always miss people when they leave, but we're really excited when they go out and do important work. This person you may recognize, Andrew McKenna Foster, he's, he's a great story. He's our, currently our director of natural science. Um, I will tell you now, and it pains me to tell you that he is leaving at the end of the summertime and uh, it's to pursue uh, more education. He's either gonna go for a master's or a doctorate um, degree. And he's been here for seven years, something like that. He's been in, he was an intern, he was a deputy director of the director of natural science. Um, and um, he's, he's really made a profound um, um, contribution to MMA and our science work that we do. Um, as well as the work he does with our interns. He's really, everybody wants to work with, uh, with Andrew. He's, uh, he's, he's really gonna be missed. Um, he also is responsible and he does a lot of the coordination with our colleges and universities. So we have visiting professors that come here and do work and, um, but we have about 50 or so colleges and universities that we work with throughout the course of the year doing various projects including in astronomy of course. Do I have until four o'clock, is that right? Yeah. yeah, okay, good, thank you. Julia Blythe is another great example. Uh, she's our biological collections manager, and she was a natural science intern for two summers. She scored two internships, but I'm not gonna, I'm just actually going to right now let her introduce herself, if I can figure out how to do it. Hi, um, I'm Julia Blythe, and um, I came here about six years ago to Mariah Mitchell as an intern, and then I started working as the collections manager, um, I think my third year here, um, and stayed for the whole year, and now I'm here on and off um, every, I don't know, four or five months for a week or two to update the collections and add more specimens and make sure everything is um, at a good humidity level and stuff like that. Um, so right now I'm working on uh, transferring some fish into alcohol and entering them into the database. Um, and if you want, let's look at the collections. Here we have some of the littler birds. These are called passerines. And in our bird collections, we have about 1,500, or getting up to 2,000 specimens. Um, and so here are some northern sawwet owls. Uh, let's see. This collection was started in part by a woman named Edith Andrews, who's turning 100 today, and I'm looking for some of her specimens. Um, here's one that was picked up by her husband on the side of the road, but skinned by someone else. Here's one of hers. So thank you, Julia. <laughs> Um, just to, um, this video here was produced as part of our, we have a science video series that we put out now. Every three or four weeks we come out with a science video and this was uh, as an example of one as well. Um, I wanted to say also that our collections actually have over 10,000 um, specimens. Um, they include, uh, in addition to birds, of course, insects, uh, you know, butterflies, beetles, plants, um, algae. Um, fish, reptiles, and amphibians. We have a huge collection that we've uh, maintained, and it's um, for over 100 years now. So it's a very um, uh, large collection, and it's a very uh, important collection. That's actually getting moved to, probably most of you here remember the old library building. 
Well, we've been refurbishing that and we're moving all of those collections over to a um, HVAC controlled environment so we can really uh, preserve those specimen, uh, specimens. So it's an important part of what we do. It's a, some, something that many people don't know that we do, but it's important in terms of research and especially with climate change issues and species, uh, issues around species. And um, uh, it's really important that we maintain these collections. So. Oh, sorry, Regina. My gosh. So I wanted to, I think it's historical that we put a space, uh, <laughs> a rocket launching here. But um, I just, I'm going to pass. Uh, Regina had came to us January 1st. Her first day on the job was actually in Florida. So I met her down there. <laughs> and we were at the AAS uh, conference, the American Astronomical Society conference. And uh, she was down there uh, working the crowd. Every year we have to find uh, students to come and be interns with us. And uh, we decided, since she was starting then, let's just get down to Florida and meet, meet some of the folks that we uh, might have as students. Uh, and she was promoting our program. But I'm going to let her, if you would, Regina, introduce yourself. Um, does anyone see? All right, why don't you stand up for a minute, Regina? Can anybody, I mean, in the black and white picture, can you tell where she is? So she was a student here a few years ago. <laughs> and she's on the left hand side with her hand, hand like this. So that's, that's Regina Jorgensen. Before you got your PhD and when you were. Um, influenced by our former astronomer and encouraged to go into astronomy. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Regina Jorgensen, our new astronomer. Oh. I'm going to interrupt you. I'm just going to say one thing. I did uh, mention that uh, Andrew was very instrumental in doing a lot of research. We actually have these books around. You've probably seen them around town. But if you haven't picked one up yet, this is a summary of all the research that's been done over the last 10 years. Um, in Nantucket Harbor. Thank you. Okay, cool. All right, I'm going to use this because I'm going to probably walk a little bit. So, hi everyone. Yeah, so I'm Regina, and um, yeah, embarrassingly enough, that is a picture um, of me when I first came to Nantucket, which was back in 1997, which also happened to be Vladimir's first year as director of astronomy. Um, and so that was myself and a couple of the other interns and Vladimir on the roof of the Vestal Street Observatory. Forward arrow. Yeah, so I also have that picture up here you can see. So um, yeah, I think um, I came as an undergraduate student in the, what I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, you can see right here the research experience for undergraduates program, which is current, I'll talk a little bit about the history, but it's currently sponsored by the National Science Foundation and a grant that we have from the National Science Foundation. Um, and you can see, um, here are a couple different examples of students um, who have come here and been inspired. And I'm obviously um, one of those. My summer here was very influential on me and um, important basically for me to decide to keep going in a career in astronomy. So it's sort of nice that I've now actually been able to come back. And it's sort of a full circle position for me to come back to this, what is really a dream job for me. So I'm really happy about that. Um, and so I want to tell you just a little bit about um, the astronomy side of the Mariah Mitchell Association and, and what we do. Um, and I think, you know, there's been many great directors of astronomy of the Mariah Mitchell Association, but I'm just going to highlight this particular one because she really started the research experience for undergraduates program. So this is Dorit. Hoflight. Um, she was the director of the Mariah Mitchell Observatory from 1957 to 79. She's actually also founded the Loins Observatory, where if you come out to our open nights at Loins, um, that was started by her. Um, she was also a well-known scientist, so she um, was one of the co-discoverers of the optical variability of quasars. So that's pretty important. Um, she's also really well known as the author of the Bright Star Catalog. So she made a lot of contributions to science. Um, but one of her most important contributions, I think, was actually starting the summer undergraduate research program, where she would invite undergraduate students to come and do research. Um, and in fact, her program became a pilot for what is now a nationally recognized program run by the National Science Foundation, which is now called the Research Experience for Undergrads program. And we are one of those sites. So we are an NSFREU site. Um, 
So um, since 1990, our site has been sponsored by the NSF to run this program. Um, and we are actually one of the most competitive programs to get into. Um, for our undergraduates, we have students, top students from around the country who apply. Um, this year, for example, we had over 200 applications just for the six positions. So it was extremely difficult to try to narrow down from such a great pool of excited and talented students. Um, but we did it, so we will have six students here, at, um, as usual, starting in June um, to do their research. And, um, <clears throat> oh right, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the influence that Mariah Mitchell um, Association has had on women and women astronomers. Um, and this is kind of a fun fact, some of you might have heard um, this before if you've been out for our tours, um, but if, if, you, if you look at the moon, right, there's lots of craters on the moon, and it turns out that 1,206 of them are named for famous people, Aristotle, whatnot. Um, 20, okay, that's a very low number. Unfortunately, only 20 of those are women. Um, of those, 27 are American women. And of those seven American women, five of them are Mariah Mitchell or connected with Mariah Mitchell. So I think that speaks to the fact that we, we, Mariah Mitchell Association and Mariah Mitchell had a huge impact on astronomy um, and science. And you can see in the photo there, there's a little arrow pointing to the Mariah Mitchell crater, which is the tiny one next to a bigger one, which is Aristotle's, actually. So, um. <clears throat> okay, um, this is another great fact um, about the Mariah Mitchell Association. Um, and I should say, the undergraduate program in the beginning when Doris started it was originally just women, okay, as the, is the tradition in, and has been since the time of Mariah Mitchell. The belief in education of women and support in, of women in science careers has been very important for us. Um, and so originally the, the program was just for women. It was opened up to men in the 1970s or 80s, something like that. So now we have a mixed gendered group. Um, but it's still an interesting fact that about one in 20 professional women astronomers today have some association with Mariah Mitchell, so they came through here as interns. Um, that's a really huge impact on our professional community. Um, and here's just a couple of examples I just grabbed from people's websites um, who, who were interns here when they were students. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about our facilities in case you haven't come out, or just to encourage you to come out um, this is Loins on Milk Street Extension. Um, there's two domes now. The second one was built primarily by a uh, National Science Foundation grant that Vladimir Stolinsky got. Um, and um, or the original um, Loins dome was built in the mid-60s by Dorrit. But just to let you know what we have inside of there, um, we have two great telescopes. Um, one historic telescope, which is the eight-inch refracting telescope, which is on your left here as you look at the slide. Um, that telescope was actually built in 1908. Um, and it's a refracting telescope, which means it has lenses in it, like your eyeglasses, to bend the light. That's the old way of making telescopes. Um, a newer, more modern type of telescope would use a mirror to uh, reflect the light. And that's what you see on the right here. This is our 24-inch modern research telescope that was insta installed in 2007. Um, again, thanks to the uh, grant from the NSF. Um, and so if you come out to Loins, um, you can have a chance to look through both of these telescopes. You can compare um, the difference. Um, I would actually argue that a lot of people enjoy looking through the old telescope a bit better. The quality of that telescope is just amazing. So um, even though it's it's smaller in diameter. And when you're talking about telescopes, it's the diameter of either the lens or the mirror that matters, not how long it is. Because the diameter is gonna let you collect more light. Um, okay, so at our Vestal Street Observatory, we also um, have another telescope um, that we use for research. Um, but just to give you a little background, um, this was built in uh, 1908. And the telescope that used to be in here was actually very instrumental in building up the large photographic plate collection that um, is part of the Mariah Mitchell Association. Um, and it has a huge amount of historic value because it's a record of what has been happening in the skies over Nantucket for the past 100 years. 
Um, so it's a very valuable resource that we have. Uh, we've digitized it. We're in the process of making it available to anybody to access online. Um, and uh, researchers are contacting us to access this. So this is something that is useful, um, has historical value, but also research value. In fact, the project that I did when I was a student here, I looked at photographic plates for my project. And not only the Mariah Mitchell plates, but I also went to Harvard and used their plate catalog as well. Because we had some dates that were missing or, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so nowadays, um, Kodak doesn't make photographic plates anymore, so that technology has died out. Um, so we don't do that anymore. Um, and so what, what's happened is that telescope has been replaced with a, a modern 17-inch research-grade telescope that we are using for research. Um, and what you can see here in front of the building is our new solar telescope, which is quite fun. So if you come by for a daytime tour and uh, it's sunny, we'll be able to look at the sun through this. So there's an H, what's called an H-alpha filter, which allows you to look at the sun in a very specific wavelength, and it's safe for your eyes. So obviously, don't just go out and look at the sun yourself. But if you come, you can have a look through our telescope and see sunspots and solar flares and, and fun things like that. Um, oh, these are nice pictures. These were the first pictures taken with those new research telescopes that we got in 2007, 2008. So I, um, you know, if you come out and look through them, you're not going to see this, right? This is a long exposure photograph. Um, so what, what you look at won't look exactly like this, but I'll show you some examples of what you might see um, in a second. Um, I don't know how much time I have. I'm just going to give a little teaser about my research. Um, I am a research astronomer, and um, so I do research on galaxy formation and evolution. I'm interested in questions like how did our galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy, come to be, and how did it form to look like what it does. This is, um, does anybody know what this is? I can give out another hat for anybody who gets that answer right. <laughs> Anybody in the audience want to guess what is this we're looking at? Not the Milky Way. Not the Milky Way. It is a galaxy. Yeah. Oh, the Andromeda. Exactly. Did you get a hat already? Maybe you need a hat. <laughs> no, this is your second prize. Yeah, so, um, so this is the Andromeda galaxy. And actually, Milky Way was a good guess because Oftentimes we see this as a representation of the Milky Way because we believe this is what the Milky Way probably looks like. It's a large spiral galaxy. Of course, we don't have pictures of the Milky Way like this because we're inside of it, right? And so we can't go outside and look back at the Milky Way. That would involve um, space travel capabilities that we don't have even close to you know, having. So, so this is actually Andromeda Galaxy. It is near, relatively nearby galaxy, it's two and a half million light years away. So uh, that's not really actually that near, but for galaxies it is. And we think that this is what our Milky Way looks like. Um, so I study um, sort of questions about that and I use um, large research facilities. So one of my goals is to continue to, and also to increase the Mariah Mitchell's Association's um, sort of profile on the world stage of astronomy and, and really make sure that we are continue to be connected with the forefront of research in, in the astronomical world. So this is myself on the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, where I worked for um, three years as a postdoc. And uh, you can see the two um, white domes are the Keck telescopes, which are the largest optical telescopes in the world. Um, and so I, I should say, I'm just going to tell you very briefly, but I'm going to be giving a talk on April 13th. Uh, at Atlas about my research. So if you're interested in more details, I'll be going into quite a bit more details about that. But what's neat, one of the neat things about this is technology today is so amazing that um, these are the Kecks here, and they both have something called laser guide star adaptive optics, which means that they, as you can see, shoot lasers into the sky. And by the way, this is a real photo. This is not Photoshopped drawing. And if you can look carefully on the upper right, side, you see actually the Milky Way. So of course, we're inside of it. So the Milky Way looks like sort of a milky band across the sky. And at the center of the Milky Way is a supermassive black hole. Okay, And this particular night, the Kecks were looking at the supermassive black hole in the center of our Milky Way. 
And so they were using both of the telescopes, which is really rare, um, to do that. And, and the laser, what the laser does is the laser actually allows you to subtract the effects of the Earth's atmosphere. The reason why stars twinkle, you know, it looks very pretty, but it's actually very bad for astronomers. Stars don't inherently twinkle. It's our atmosphere that's wiggling, and it causes the light to appear as if it were twinkling. And so what astronomers, very brilliant astronomers, have come up with this idea is that if you shoot a laser up into the sky, the laser interacts with a sodium layer in the atmosphere about 10 kilometers up, and it makes a point, like an artificial star. And we know that should be round or the shape of the laser. And you see it wiggly, and then basically you can say, well, I, I know what those wiggles are doing, and so I can subtract that out. And so it's a way of taking out the atmosphere, which is very, very powerful for us. Um, and so that these, these Keck telescopes, even though they're on the ground, are much more powerful than the Hubble Space Telescope, which is in space, which is also amazing. But I won't get started on that. Anyway, so um, I do some research into, I try to look for baby galaxies in the very early universe. So where are the galaxies that in the early universe turn into large spiral galaxies like our Milky Way? And uh, I recently found one of them using the Keck telescope that I just showed you. And uh, I got a bunch of press, which was really fun, on the work that came out of it. So I'll talk about that in more detail in my, in my science talk, which I'll... I'll give you the details about at the end. Um, so just some things, coming attractions um, for Brian Mitchell Association. Actually, this Saturday, we're going to have a star party, if you haven't heard about this yet. Um, this is happening out at Loins at 8 PM, free and open to the public. Just drop by. Um, the, the difference between a star party and a normal open night, normally we have open nights. Um, this is a, um, a particularly, particular event that is sponsored in part by Remain um, to encourage our sort of year-round activities on Nantucket. And we've invited out um, from Boston several amateur astronomers from the Antique Telescope, Antique Telescope Maker Society. Um, and so they are going to come out with a lot of their telescopes, set them up. So basically, you'll have your sort of normal open night plus a whole bunch of other really knowledgeable amateur astronomers with telescopes. Um, out there. So we'll be looking at lots of stuff in the sky and you'll be able to talk to them about any telescope questions you might have. Um, I just wanted to include some pictures of what you might actually see if you haven't been out to Loins to look through our telescopes um, to, to tempt you a little bit of what, you, what you'll see. Okay? Um, Saturn's actually not up right now. It's up in the morning. So, so right now, you, you won't see Saturn up at night. But Jupiter, which is below Saturn, and then Jupiter is also up here. I, I wanted to put that one in because you can see the four Galilean moons, which you will be able to see. And you also will be able to pick out the stripes on Jupiter, the red spot. You may look at a star cluster, like in the lower right, the Orion Nebula in the middle. So these are the sorts of things that we look at. Um, by the way, current events, in terms of current events, I don't know, maybe some of you saw this in the news. This was just a, I think it actually happened on March 17th, but it took a while to come out in the news. Somebody, an amateur, actually caught this on video. An object, a comet or asteroid, just hit Jupiter. And it, it made a bright flash. It was just sort of on the side of Jupiter that we couldn't quite see, but it was uh, uh, visible enough that it made a flash. You can see the arrow pointing towards the flash. Um, and so Jupiter just suffered an impact. Um, and, uh, you know, we say, we should say thank you to Jupiter because, you know, Jupiter is very massive, right? And so it, it's going to, its gravity is going to affect things in our entire solar system. And it will tend to attract things like this more so than we will. And so in a way, Jupiter is actually protecting us from impacts like this. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, I just wanted to go over some coming attractions. Um, I said the star party already on April 2nd. Um, on April 13th, I'm going to be giving the science pub at Atlas. That starts at 6 PM. And again, it's free. Come have a drink, some food if you want. Um, and I'm going to talk about my research. Um, and that's hosted by the Linda Loring uh, Nature Foundation as well. Um, our next open nights in April are April 18th and 19th. Um, on April 22nd is the Lyrids meteor shower. Unfortunately, this year, that coincides with the full moon. So it won't be that spectacular because you're going to be fighting with the brightness of the full moon. So it'll be a little bit hard to see um, 
see much of that. What will be exciting, though, I think, is May 9th. There's a, a pretty cool and fairly rare event coming up called the Transit of Mercury. What this means is that Mercury will be appearing to go over the disk of the sun. Okay, I think the whole event will take about nine hours. I think most of it will be visible for, from, for us here on Nantucket. Um, the peak or the sort of main transit time is around 11 in the morning. So we're gonna have some sort of special event. I think that's a Monday. We'll have our telescopes out. You can come by, have a look, see what it looks like when a planet passes in front of the sun. Um, it's pretty cool. And then our May open nights, May 15th and 16th. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say, actually. So yeah, I can hand it back to you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So, but we can open it up for questions in one minute. I just want to say something, um, one more thing. And Regina, that was terrific. I get so excited to hear about the things you're working on and learn something new every, every single time. I'm really excited this summer. Um, I get, you know, I was here last summer. I stepped in on June 1st, and I really had no idea what I was what I was getting to. Because you can look on the website and sort of understand, but you know, we had like 700 kids go through our camp program. Um, we started a speaker series or reinstituted it last year. We'll be doing it again this year. So every week we'll have a scientist from either on island or off island here uh, at Mariah Mitchell. I just please come and visit us. We're up the street. Uh, Vestal Street is where a lot of the activity happens. Our Natural History Museum is there. Lots of interesting uh, exhibits there. The aquarium, of course, on Washington Street. Uh, and, and the observatory. So there's a ton of things going on all summer long. Um, it's kind of amazing. Just like the NHA, when you look at their schedule of events and activities, it's astounding what this uh, island has to offer. And um, just one other thing is we had a great science festival. We did it at the school system uh, two weeks ago on a Saturday. And we had 375 people come to that. It was mostly younger kids and their families, but it was a great opportunity for them to learn about science. So something we're really excited about and excited to keep growing as well. So I just want to show you, and you will see this for the first time. Nobody has seen this yet, but you will be seeing it around town. And I'm just going to put it on and say no more about it. Honey, am I going overboard with the whale thing? Hmm. The turtle got out again? Okay, we need to put up posters. So much harder than it was online. Where are you going? I'm going to a park. And you can't come. Can I get a little help here? How's it going? We are okay? It's bad. It's really bad, guys. I can tell. Okay. Thanks, Bill, for letting me show that. <laughs> so thank you very, very much. And is there any, Regina, you want to come up? Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Yes. I have a question, but I probably should have spoken sooner. I have two daughters that were raised here on Nantucket, and they both benefited by Mariah Mitchell, um, and both in their work today, um, I would say use the skills to encourage them to do in their further education. Away from here, it, one of my daughters is in research, um, targeted cancer research, and my other daughter is music um, and art, and she does a lot of artwork now that she's back here on the island of the creatures that live here. And she's been doing it since she took her snorkeling class in a summer camp at Mariah Mitchell. Then they were both in a group of, it, it, it was a youth group, and it was middle school and then early high school years. And they said, there's nothing to do. And I kept thinking about stuff at nighttime at the Loins Observatory. And um, they all, were so excited to go there and spend time at the observatory with Vladimir and have their questions answered. And I know a couple of those kids have gone on. Um, and of course, they read lots about Mariah Mitchell, and that was a wonderful thing for both of them. My older daughter spent a month, and I, it was some kind of a grant program, in the fourth grade um, researching whether or not 
sound travels in a vacuum. And she's a singer, and she was always fascinated by sound. And that was done at Mariah Mitchell, and it was a wonderful opportunity for her. So just thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Great. Do we have any other questions? I, oh, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> I have one. David, I, thanks very much, Regina and David. I, I was, uh, I've been thinking about your question about what one thinks of when they think of Mariah Mitchell, and I really enjoyed hearing the sampling. Uh, I have to say that from an executive director perspective, coming onto an island that's so collaborative in nature has been really refreshing because other places I've worked have not been that uh, collaborative. You, you demonstrate it, and I, I have to say that when I first came 10 years ago, it was not only demonstrated, but the person taking the lead in all of that was your own uh, Janet Schulte, who oftentimes would call us together to talk about anything from visitor visitor evaluations, to uh, cultural districts, to uh, tours, group tours. And so I really appreciate that. And having met you number, a number of times uh, informally and talked about these things, I'm, I'm really reassured that, that that will continue. So thanks. And, and most recently with the One Book, One Island, which uh, was very successful. So, so thanks for bringing that collaborative nature onto the island. Do we have any other questions? Any questions at all? Great. Um, well, feel free to come up and talk to them after this. Um, if we could give a warm round of applause for such a fabulous presentation. And a big thank you um, to David and Regina for joining us today.